recording. Uh, today's workshop is really me going through um, what we plant in our community and school gardens. I'm going to go into um, the different steps that we do per plant. Um, not going to talk too much about the varieties per se, but introduce that there are more than one uh, variety of different different crops to use. And um, majority of the content that I have here is actually uh, I myself. Um, received it by attending um, a gardening workshop by the Wild Center, which is a which is a food uh, educational natural resource uh, conservation organization based in Atlanta, Georgia. And so I've attended numerous of their workshops in the community. And so some of the content it, it might say Atlanta on the slideshows, but I will emphasize what's relevant to us here in Southwest Georgia. And so. Um, with all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and open up the PowerPoint slide. But if I can, the way that I'm going to do this, um, if you do have questions that start to come up um, during the presentation, feel free to put them into the chat box. And then also during the presentation, I would naturally like pause if I know about the change um, subject matter or change to a particular um, what I call a group of plants just to make it easier for you guys to keep up. And then also this is being recorded. It will be posted to the Flint River Fresh um, website. And we have, a, we have a page called the DIY Toolkit. And it will be listed on there for you guys to refer back to and to share with friends um, of what you've learned today. And again, it's gonna be a lot of content. I'm anticipating that we'll probably go between an hour and an hour 15. Um, in this presentation and this talk. So I'm gonna go ahead and begin to share my screen. And again, if you have any comments that you have, uh, feel free to share them in the chat box. Um, okay, and let me begin. All right, so today we're talking about growing a spring garden. Um, this presentation itself is part of a program that we have in partnership with the Doherty County Board of Commissions, uh, Flint River Fresh and the GGA Extension, and the project is called Doherty Fresh. So what is Flint River Fresh? Uh, we are a nonprofit uh, based in Albany, Georgia. We, we predominantly work in four counties, um, Cockwood, Doherty, Houston, and Sumter County. And our work in the community is based upon uh, four pillars. Uh, food access, we just believe everybody should have access to fresh food. We also feel that through agriculture, we can make a difference in the lives of young people. Um, we also believe in creating economic opportunities for local farmers and supporting our local ag. And lastly, uh, Flint River Fresh, we are the urban agricultural arm for the Flint River Soil Water Conservation District. So we go out and provide uh, technical assistance and provide demonstrations on ways that we can conserve our natural resources for future generations. So the blessing of that we have here in Southwest Georgia, as we are like growing food and things like that, is that we literally have three main growing seasons. So the first part of this talk will just be what I call some foundational things that everybody should just know um, in their back pocket. So our three growing seasons are spring, summer, fall slash winter. So right now we're in the midst of the spring season and that's why we're gonna talk about what to start your spring garden. But what you plant in the spring, you'll begin harvesting it um, about mid-March going into um, April, the end of April. And so these are just the three breakdowns of the different growing seasons that we have in our area. So again, I always tell people, we literally could grow food here in Southwest Georgia, gardening zone 8B, um, 365 days out the year, we could have fresh uh, fruits and vegetables that could be harvested from our backyard gardens, our urban farm plots, our community gardens and our school gardens. So rule number one, whenever you're looking at establishing a gardening space, this is just a, a fundamental thing to do. Site selection is everything. You wanna make sure that it has access to full sun and a, a, at least a minimum 
of six to eight hours of direct sunlight. You want to make sure that it's inconvenient, uh, conveniently located to a water source. Oftentimes I tell people you don't want your water spigot or to be dragging around a hundred foot water hose to keep your garden um, um, watered. You want to make sure everything is at close walking distance to a spot where you feel uh, rather comfortable. And lastly, you want to make sure that it's on soil that is well drained. Um, and then also you just want to make sure that you have like a good soil mixture that you're working out of. So spraying gardens. Um, what I would say, these are your basic to do's before you start getting down and dirty about planting the garden space. So number one, please take the time to remove all weeds uh, from the garden bed that you're growing in. Or if you're doing an in-ground garden plot, please take the time to um, till up or remove the tarp to kill off any of the weeds that might be in the area. Also, refresh your space with a, a good heavy dosing of compost. Um, to put into the garden space around the beds. And I even explain a little bit later um, how I even encourage you to actually use um, compost throughout the whole gardening process. Um, three, if you have like a walk path, um, you wanna make sure that you're putting down something to suppress the weeds and the grass that can be growing on your walk path. So we oftentimes we do a project where we put down cardboard, um, layer it with like wood chips, or just like in this picture, we'll put down landscape fabric um, around like the growing areas just to keep the grass and stuff out. And then the fourth thing is making sure that you have a supply of um, wheat straw or like some molded leaf um, to mulch around your garden, uh, especially in the, like the garden bed. And that really helps with um, number one, the mulch helps with creating um, a lot of biological activity around the soil. Two, it helps retain the water. Um, and it keeps the, the, the soil um, temperature cool and relevant. And then like, and then the third thing as well, um, the mulch helps create like some sort of barrier for weeds not to grow um, and things like that in your garden space. So these are just some things that you should be doing um, in your garden area, especially if you're doing in-ground garden plots or you're doing raised garden beds, all right? So two, one thing that we wanna think about is, and I have a, one thing that we want to think about is your plant spacing. So there are like three methods to planting. So you have just your standard single row. You tend to see that a lot uh, when you drive out a big the farmer's field. Even I do it like in my 30 by 30 in-ground garden plots, which is a strictly just a straight row. Plants are spaced a certain distance apart uh, based upon their requirements. That's simple. The third, the second thing is broadcasting. Um, this is really, I only do broadcast related to like salad mixes. Um, and basically you're just scattering seeds um, in a broad area with no sort of like uniformity to it and things like that. And then the third thing that we do is what we call block planting. And that's where you uh, identify like a block area. They might be in a row block together, triangular block, but just basically focusing in on growing in a four by four sort of like growing space. So with that being said, one of the things that we really encourage people to do is a concept that we have really started utilizing a lot in the past like five to seven years at our school gardens, uh, which is about square foot gardening. And uh, basically what that is, it's like a small, it's an intensive way of growing in your garden space where you're literally maximizing every foot of the garden um, to grow food. And so there's a whole, uh, through this workshop, I emphasize like which ones um, you're going to do for square foot gardening. And, and the basic premise is that you're taking a, a four by four or four by eight raised garden bed and you're breaking it down into smaller one foot by one foot semi squares that you use for your planting method uh, for growing in that space. And what we like about it, again, it's an easy technique for us to do. It's easy for us to work with children and help them identify where their plants should be at. And it's just uh, an easier method for growing and keeping it organized nice and neat. And then for the youth, um, it allows for us to incorporate their math skills so they can help us determine um, like how many plants per square, um, 
what's the area, you know, things like that. So we're looking at ways that we can teach the young people about what we're doing. All right. So just real quick, here are like, our, I talked about spacing, but then just in terms of that, here is just some basics relating to like planting techniques that we do in our garden space. So like I said before, broadcasting, that's just directly scattering seeds. Um, the second thing that we will be talking about, some plants will do what we call direct seeding. And that's literally putting the seed in the ground, covering it up so many inches or so apart from each other. Um, the third thing we do a lot, which is called transplanting. And that's where we've already established a basic plant or seedling. And we are literally putting it into the, the container garden, the end row or the raised garden box. And it's pretty much, it's ready to go. We're just ready to take care of it. And then some things we do a technique that's more about thinning. So like some crops, because they're so small, the seeds are that you literally line them up into a row, but you have to go back after the true leaves have been established to thin them out to give it its proper like spacing related to what we're about to grow. All right. And so with that, any questions that you guys might have, feel free to drop it into the chat box. And so Brent, I saw your question related to about free mulch. The only free mulch that I've actually the, the thankfulness of our community garden space is like a lot of times um, individuals have bags of leaves in the community. And so they've been able like to donate that to us. And then there was one point in time, I'm assuming that you're in Doherty County, but at, at one point in time, the um, Chiha Park, after the storms came through, they had a lot of like wood chips and stuff that was available for us to be able like to go and, and get like truckloads of it and utilize it like in our garden spaces. Now there, I know in some communities and some municipalities, there is like free public mulch because of the tree debris, uh, tree debris and things like that. Um, I don't know of any quite like that in Doherty County. I know I've asked like public works before about having something like that, but they wasn't able to, um, the, to basically make that happen. Like, I guess because like the mixture of leaves and some other stuff and manpower that wasn't able to obtain it and do that. All right, you're welcome, Brent. All right, so now we're about to get into uh, the nuts and bolts of what today is all about. So like I said earlier, I'm gonna go crop by crop. I'm gonna talk about how we plant them, how we take care of them. And some of them are gonna talk more about the ways that we have uh, like bug pressure related to these crops. And again, these are now, this isn't everything that you go for the spring, but this is what Flint River Fresh grows in our community gardens, school gardens, um, and urban farm demonstration sites in the different counties that we work with. So there are, and I'll probably touch upon a couple other like crops towards the end, but this is what we call like our staples that we plant in our spring garden. And again, our spring garden planting takes place beginning February 15th, all the way through to March 15th. So everything that you're about to see on this slide, if you haven't planted, you can start now preparing a spot to plant everything that we're about to talk about for the next uh, 45 minutes, okay? So number one, potatoes. All right, let's move this out of the way. All right, so potatoes. Jabbed up, one second. All right, there we go. So basic requirements for potatoes. Um, number one, you wanna make sure that it's direct, like at a minimum of 10 hours of direct sunlight. You wanna make sure that it's in a soil that is um, loose, well-drained, um, easy for you to work. Um, and, and you really wanna work your soil for potatoes like a week or two before you get ready to plant. And so what we do a lot for our potatoes is start uh, for the in-ground plots, we start tilling up the ground, getting it loose, adding compost. For our raised boxes, we start breaking it up with the pitchfork um, before we get ready to plant. And then, then if you're doing like containers, we just really just talk about adding like compost to it. But you wanna make sure that it's a spot that the water is evenly um, 
dries out, evenly spread, because one thing that you don't want to have is water sitting around the base of your potatoes. Um, that will cause a, a root disease um, to happen to your potatoes and the water log happens, your potatoes end up being rotten and you just lightly just, just mix it. And then the other thing is, I, I, I emphasize this to people, you do have to fertilize your potatoes. So we recommend a product called Espoma um, Garden Tone. Like every other week, just sprinkle a little bit of this around like the base. So it could be like a teaspoon of it if it's like one plant or if you're doing like a 50 foot row, you might use like two cups of it and just sprinkle it around like the base of the plant as you're starting to um, heal up the garden plant, all right? So varieties, like I said before, you, there are so many options when it comes to you just growing your potatoes at home in your backyard and community. And so it, it's just so much for you to choose from. But what we tend to do a lot at our garden sites is that when we grow the red skin variety of potatoes. So we do like the red Pontiac, the red Norland in particular. And most of the potatoes that we use, we're able to pick them up at the local um, feed and seed store. So if you're here in Albany, um, you could go to Bennett's Feed and Seed on North Washington, and they have them in, in bags where they have the red Pontiacs, they have like the um, they have like the Yukon Gold, the white Kennebec, but if you're more adventurous, there are some other companies, and we'll have like a uh, this PowerPoint to be shared for you guys to look, that we'll have a list of other like seed companies that you could possibly go to. Now, I will be up front, there is like a seed shortage, so some of like the, the unique seed potato varieties that you might be looking for, they might already be shipped out. And that's just because of the nature of the pandemic that has been an increase in the amount of individuals willing and wanting to grow their own food. And in some ways that demand has surpassed um, the actual amount of seeds that are available. So when it comes to getting started, again, there's just a difference. Some people ask, hey, can I, grow the um, potatoes that I have at the grocery store that have started sprouting. Uh, you can do that if they're organic, but if they are like a conventional Irish potato, we don't recommend that. We actually make sure that you utilize a certified seed potato. Then the other thing that people oftentimes ask, do, do, do I plant it where there's a little sprout as you see in the picture or a, not a sprout? And so we've had, we do both of them because we haven't really seen that much of a difference uh, between if we like what the growth looks like in the harvest. So that's fine with us. But one thing that we do recommend is that you cut your potatoes into cubes or in half based upon the size of it. So when you're planting a potato, you want to have, make sure there's like one or two, what we call eyes um, per cutling um, for the potato. And then the last thing is um, some people like to put sulfur or wood ash to help with the healing process after it's cut. We do. We actually don't do that. Normally when we cut our potatoes, uh, we put them in a five gallon bucket in a cool dark place for about three to five days. And then we're out, out then we're out outside planting. Now, if you don't plant it within those three to five days, that could be fine. As long as you plant it within the week, like seven to 10 days after you cut them. Because then after that, it can start to, the moisture of the potato can cause it to dry out and, and eventually just be setting yourself up for like rot. So one thing we just encourage you to do after you cut your potatoes, let it heal for like three or five days um, and then plant it. But you want to make sure that you get it into the ground no later than 10 days after you cut the potato. All right. So when it comes time to plant the potatoes, like I said before, you want to work the soil up, till or no till. It's up to you. But the thing, too, we encourage is um, crop rotation. So for those that don't know, potatoes are actually related to tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. They're part of the nightshade family. And you can see that, especially with potatoes when they're growing and you look at the leaves. I don't know how many times I've seen people like stop at our community garden and ask, well, are those, are those potatoes growing, are, are those tomatoes growing over there? And my response is like, no, those are potatoes because their leaves look very similar to a tomato plant. So once you kind of get your ground and stuff worked up, the next thing that we encourage you to do is add compost um, to like the, the area that you're planting. So if it's a raised bed, add compost. If you're doing it in the ground, add compost. If you are planting them in buckets, just add a little bit of compost. And so in the rows, 
you want to make sure that your rows are spaced out three feet apart. And what I mean by that, so if you're in ground garden spot, three feet spacing between your rows for your potatoes. And the three feet is necessary because as a, to, as a potato grows, you're going to do a process that we call mounding the potato, kind of keep covering up. And I have like a diagram that shows you what happens by you mounding potatoes. And so having that, you want to just dig a trench that's roughly about uh, six to eight inches deep. And a lot of times what I do is just take like a hoe, walk it into the row as deep enough in the raised garden boxes. Um, what I like to do for our four by eights is actually just do one single row of potatoes in our four by eight boxes. Because again, we're going to be healing them up. Um, and then the other thing that you want to just make sure that you do is that you want to make sure that you have your, your potatoes spaced out um, about 12 inches apart. You know, like a, a lot of times we work with kids and stuff in the schools. We just say like you want to put a potato between your toe and your heel, your toe and your heel. So if you look at this picture, you can imagine somebody stepping in the trench. So between their toe and the heel, we have like two potatoes. We kind of just work ourselves down. Um, to do that with growing potatoes into our garden spaces. So this is just a diagram that kind of shows you the growth pattern of the potato. So looking at that, that cutting, those eyes are like those first little shoots that you see popping up, the roots come, then eventually it sprouts some green. We start to cover it up. As you see, the mound begins to expand. Some more of the mound that you're covering up of the plant the more potato like shoots that kind of come off of the, the roots of it, it keeps growing, keep growing. And eventually the potato is going to die off on itself. And what I love is the little flowers that start to pop up on your potatoes. Cause that's really showing you that, that you really have some growth happening underneath the ground. And then you're going to have like a really good potato harvest. Normally on average, one potato plant off of just the way I told you about cutting into half or the cubic can yield you about three to um, like three to five pounds of potatoes, as long as you keep that fertilizer schedule going. Now, if you don't fertilize, you're just gonna get what you can get. <coughs> but please, please, please make sure you fertilize. So this is just some more information about harvesting the potatoes. Um, again, two to three weeks after planting, you're gonna just like pay attention to the maturity of it. Roughly, like I tell most folks, and again, like I said, the bar the slideshow from the Wild Center, but here in Southwest Georgia, if you plant your potatoes before the end of March, going into May, you actually begin to start harvesting um, the potato that you planted. And you kind of can keep those potatoes in the ground um, up until about the middle of May, um, depending on when you plant them. But again, about 90 to 100 days, they're ready to go. And then just for storage sake, you want to make sure that you keep them in a dry, cool place. Um, that's dark if you want to like store them because if they are exposed to light they'll start to reproduce shoots and, and things like that so you just want to just be mindful of it. but if you store them properly your potatoes that you harvested you'll be able to hold in place for two to three two to three months so the next crop we're going to focus in on is um, peas so again if you have like any questions put them into the chat box um, yes great question um, Brent as well uh, when you do have those potatoes growing, those flowers are a pollinator, a good pollinator for like other like honeybees and, and birds and stuff. So that's just one of those things that you can help with the ecosystem uh, of, of us getting something and, and mother nature getting something like that in return. And so, yes, you can grow them as well in containers, but you want to make sure of if you do the potatoes that um Oftentimes I recommend that people file like a bucket that's about 15 gallons um, in size or bigger. If you're gonna do the bucket container garden, uh, potatoes, you might could do one plant in a five gallon bucket, which means you only get like three pounds of potatoes. So most families, you know, you probably wanna stock up about 15 to 20 pounds. So I get like 15 to 25 gallon um, wine barrel sort of container would be really good. They do have some other products that are like um, grow bags that you could purchase from. Um, I know Mark's, I know Bennett's carries them. Uh, Mark's Greenhouse carries some of the grow bags. And then you can get them online. They're just basically like a fabric um, container and you can grow potatoes and things like out of that. So again, if you have questions that come up, 
You can do like what Brent is doing, just put them into the chat box and I'll answer them um, as I might stop it and move it on to like the next thing. So I appreciate the conversation and the questions. So next, peas. So let me get this right again. So for us again, like you want to like start planting your peas again, everything we're talking about today is from February 15th to March 15th. Um, and again, this is part of like our spring growing season and session. Um, oftentimes we tell people when it comes to starting peas, they're going to start from seeds. Some people know from transplants, but we've had great success with growing our seeds and everything directly, put them into the ground on average, like what we're talking about here. If you're doing like a square foot garden sort of thing, you're gonna do like eight peas in one one foot by one foot space. Um, they're gonna be two feet apart. If you're looking at doing them in rows, you're gonna roughly have, if you're doing a two foot row, 16 seeds of pea seeds. If you're doing an eight foot row, 64 inches. So again, your peas themselves, you're really planting them um, about two to about four inches apart in the rows. Um, it's going to work for you to have like a bundleful harvest. But the thing that sets peas apart is that you have so many varieties. And I oftentimes have to pause here because when I say peas, we're in Southwest Georgia. So we automatically start thinking, uh, you know, our cream 40s, our cream 12s, our pink eye purple holes. But these are what we call your English peas and your winter peas. So we're talking like your, your snack peas or, um, and I like to group the, the peas and the potatoes kind of together because in, in meals, these are the type of peas you normally eat with your Irish potatoes. Um, and so just having that in mind, and again, there's so many different diverse varieties of them out there. So many different companies you can reach out to. We mainly just do like a, a, a basic, like the basic green arrow shelling pea, which is like a good, just fat English pea. That's what we do a lot of. We rarely do like the snap peas. Cause again, a lot of times with the kids, they can peel them open and things like that. But what you want to have for your peas that's most important is the trellising. So you want to have some sort of trellising system where your peas are growing because they do sprawl. And if you just let them linger on the ground, um, they'll get they'll get disease, they'll get rot, and it'll be hard for you to pick them. So by having a trellis system with them going vertical, it makes it easier on you for picking. Um, in, in some regards, any, any, it gives you a lot of personality to your backyard garden space too, because you got like archways and, and things like that. But you want to make sure that you lift the peas up off the ground. And one of the basic things, again, this is just me reiterating what I said to begin with. Um, you just want to make sure that you're planting it during the right time, two inches of spacing for your seed. When it comes to the depth of the seeds, and this is going to be something I repeat more than once, the depth of your seed is literally just double the diameter of the seed. So if you hold the seed between your two fingers, whatever that is, just double that the depth. And it's important because you don't want to bury your seeds too deep um, because it'll take it longer for it. To, sometimes it won't germinate. Sometimes enough water doesn't get to it for the process of germination to happen. So you just want to make sure you just kind of follow that process. And then I, I'll put down to... Um, Normally for English peas, when you plant them in about like five, no longer than two weeks, and it takes for like the seed to germinate. So just be patient with it. You might don't see it and pop up right away, but give it like a week, seven days or two weeks and you'll be fine. And the ultimate trick too, is that you want to make sure that if you're doing it by seed, that you water your plant every day till the seed germinates. You want to make sure you do that, especially because we have like these hot days, sun is it's beaming. You want to make sure that you keep that seed moist until it germinates as part of that process. And like everything else, a minimum of six, eight hours of direct sunlight. When is the time to harvest? I always tell people just by filling the pot, if they're like filled up, um, the whole like the whole pea shell is filled. It's just that it's just that simple. It's ready time for you to pick it. You might have like six to eight different fat peas and things inside. Just look for like a plump pie and pick it. And oftentimes I tell people like the more you harvest it, the more that it's going to grow and the more it's going to produce. And the same thing, like I said, for um, container gardens. So if you're looking at going to make containers and buckets, you can actually do these in five gallon buckets. But you want to make sure that you have some sort of trellising system for the peas 
to, to ride up on um, and to grow off of just to make it easier for like planting. And the main thing for the containers for the peas, you just need something with a depth of about like eight, eight inches. You know, so it doesn't have to be extremely deep, but just enough for the roots to catch hold and you could actually start growing like your own peas at home in a container, in your yard, in a raised garden box, on and so forth. All right, good. No question on peas. Cool. So the third crop that we kind of do, and again, I'm putting, I, I like to talk about what I'm growing in relationship to almost us cooking a meal. So growing up as a kid, you had your, your some potatoes, your peas, and with a little bit of onions. So we're going to focus a little bit on the onion crops on how to do it. Now, with the onions, there's actually like what we call like two phases of onion. I have garlic on here, but I don't really do a lot of garlic in our, our school and community garden plots. But I do have some information that I can share with those that are interested on how to grow garlic and how to do it. But a lot of like your garlic, your garlic plant, planting, I'll talk about that more doing what the plant in the fall. And so, but because garlic and onion are re related, everything that I talk about here with the onion will also apply to those doing garlic, but I do a more in-depth garlic presentation um, going into what the plant for the fall. So spring onions, again, this is the right time that you wanna do it, but what you wanna pay attention to when you buy onions. We're in Southwest Georgia. So we want our onions to be what we call short day onions that only have like a certain amount of like, like sunlight to produce and to grow because the more sunlight that it has, the, the, the longer the, the bulb can grow. But because we have like shorter windows and our, our, um, our weather climate changes, we look for short day onions. And I emphasize this, one of the first onions I heard people talking about was a Walla Walla onion which was like this sweet tasting onion that everybody raved about and all these market gardening books that I was following at the time, but they were long day onions. Like they only really grow like in the state of Washington. And so we found, don't make sure that you just pay attention to the type of onion that you're growing. That as a day lift increases the 10 or 12 onions, that's what we wanna pay attention to. But for us, thank the Lord that we're like in a, in a county or an area of the United States where we're able to really grow um, like our Vidalia onion types, like our bulb types. So we still have a good variety of onions that we can grow in our area. So this is just like an example of some of the ones that we grow. So we do a lot of the red Creole. We do a lot of like the granites, which is like similar to like a Vidalia. And then we also do, uh, we also do, it's not on here. We do one that's called like a Texas legend. And we do another one that's a, a sweet onion um, as well, like in our community garden spaces. And as a tad note, we also interplant onions um, in our brassica plots because we, and also with our strawberries, because we've also found that naturally um, onions, because of the odor that it gives off and, and the smell, is a deterrent for some pests invading like your garden spaces. So as a way to deal with pest control, we also intercrop onions into the space. And so by planting them into the spring, you can have like a decent basic size bulb or in our community, you know, a lot of people just love like a good fresh like spring onion. So the choices that you have, you can cross out the seed. The seed is more if you're going to look at doing onions in the fall because you'll want to start your seeds beginning in September. So right now you can definitely do like your onion sets. Um, same thing, just paying attention to like the day length. There are plenty that are out there for you to use. Um, I tend to do a lot more of my live plants at our garden spaces because we get them in bundles of 50 to like a thousand of them. And we plant them in our raised beds as well as in the ground um, in our community gardens, things like that. So I'm back that up. So with the onions, they're normally spaced out between four to six inches apart um, in the row and in the raised garden boxes. And so if you're doing square foot gardening for your garden spaces, you actually can fit nine onion plants in a one foot by one foot space. And so we multiply that out. If you're doing a bucket, a five gallon bucket, same thing, you can fit nine onion plants into that space. And then how we do in our in-ground garden plots is we like to plant our onions on what we call double rows. So what that means is rather than having like just one single row of onions, we will actually put them about four or five inches apart in a row and run a double row, and that double row will be like three feet apart 
um, in the garden space. And so one other thing I, I forgot to mention, I'm also going to do some individual um, gardening demonstrations where each of these crops that I'm talking about, I actually will be out in the field doing a live demonstration or a video demonstration so you guys can really see what I'm talking about. Um, you know, I call it like hand of dirt in practice, you know, because I know in conversation, it makes sense to me, but I'm also a visual learner as well. So we're going to have like some videos about showing how we plant these and what it looks like for each of these plants as well. All right. All right. And so when it comes to the depth of the like the onion plant, uh, we tend to tell people, especially with the live plants or even with the, um, the bulbs, we just tell them roughly to put it into the ground with the bulbs about an inch to two inches deep. With the onion plants, if you kind of look at the picture, you really just want to kind of cover up that first little root ball. So I always tell people, think of a, an, a from the eraser tip to the metal on a pencil is about as deep as you want to get. Or if we go deeper, that's fine with the live plant. We haven't really served, saw like any problems. But then if you do start to see like the bulb or the root exposed, um, we do add like compost and things like that around the base of the plant. Just again, it doesn't really hurt it, but we, we just encourage for like the, the bulb or the root to kind of grow a little bit deeper. Um, I mean, wider, just add a little bit of compost as we're mixing. And then also we do fertilize like our onion plants. So utilizing that, the plant tone that I talked about on like a two week sort of schedule of just like fertilizing the plant, making sure that you feed it. Because obviously if you're growing an onion, you want a nice big size bulb. And that really happens um, through fertilizing and fertility. And so what we emphasize a lot lately is making sure that you have a fertilizer plan that feeds the plants like every two weeks. If you're doing like the buckets or the containers, you can look at feeding them like once a month just because it's more in a concentrated space. Same thing if you're doing like the raised garden beds, just feed the plants um, at least once a month and you'll be fine. But for your in-ground plants, you really want to have a system where you're feeding the plant every other week with an organic fertilizer to make sure they're fed and, and they're holding their own um, growing. All right, turnips. So this is, <laughs> this is one of my favorite plants to grow because a lot of what it takes to grow a turnip plant is literally um, just having like a space. And most of the time the seeds, you're only really planting them about a quarter of an inch deep, which is literally um, like your fingertips and they produce and they grow. And it's really easy again for like children to plant turnips and, and grow it out. So there's just some basic for like turnip seeds. Again, a lot of different varieties. We tend to grow mainly like purple top um, turnips in our community garden sites. We do do the white egg or the hawkeye, which is like a more sweeter tasting um, turnip. But these are just some basics for growing like turnips. So again, if you're doing it in the row, they're basically spaced out three inches apart. You want your rows. We, we do the turnips the same way we do the onions on a double row. So the double row again has these turnips spaced out about six inches with our drip irrigation going across like the, going in between the plants for watering and our raised beds. We're doing square foot gardening. We have the plant space, nine plants per square. You can do the math. And a lot of times when I tell people you do love turnips, you can actually like uh, what we call a session plant. So you don't necessarily have to plant all your turnips at one time. You can do, you know, like a, a good three or four blocks of turnips for one week, come back two weeks later, do like another block or another bucket of turnips. So that way you constantly have like a harvest related to like your turnip plants. All right. And that's just, again, like the basics, turnips, that's what we're growing. All right. Again, just some more reminders. And so turnips is one of those ones as well, because the seeds are, so small that we have to do some thinning. So again, what the thinning is, as the seeds start to sprout up, you're gonna realize that you might have more than one or two plants growing in the same space. So we just encourage people to go ahead and thin them out where they're roughly about four inches apart in the rows. If you're doing like the square foot gardening, you just wanna make sure that you end up with one turnip plant in that, well, nine turnip plants in the square, but one in that sort of growing space sort of spread out. And the thing too to remember, whenever you're growing things from seed, it's important that you keep the plant watered every day until it germinates. And germinates means that seed has sprouted, that you see the green coming up off the soil, you're ready to go. And then the last piece, like I talked about here when thinning out, uh, as a reminder, 
you don't want to necessarily pull the turnip out. You just basically want to pinch the leaves right at the soil level. Because if you pull out the uh, pull the plant out, you could be disturbing the root of the one that you want to keep. And then you just like lost out uh, for that. So again, like I mentioned before, every two weeks, sow some more turnip seeds to have like a steady harvest of it. And if you have plants, and I added this note because like here in some communities, um, they only eat the turnip root. But I was raised when my grandmama did it, where we ate the entire turnip, the green leaves and the roots and everything was what we consume and we ate with the turnip plants. So again, that's just something as a reminder to you about turnips. So going back, just in containers, you can do again, the five gallon bucket, same sort of thing, six to eight inches, nine plants in per bucket, spacing two to four. Main thing again, please, 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 if you're doing anything from seed, make sure that you are watering it every day until the seed germinates. So if you know that you might have like a, a day or two that you might be gone, you make sure you wanna reach out to people or even look at some automatic um, watering systems. And that's part of like our veggie um, gardening workshop that I'll talk about towards the end of this um, presentation. All right, we're good. So next crops up is, um, and again, if you have any questions related to the different things that I'm growing or any of the different techniques, uh, feel free to put into the chat box. And also, like I said, we're gonna be doing crop related videos um, that we will start to add to the do-it-yourself toolkit page. So that way you guys see um, exactly how we do it, what it looks like um, in real time for like a shorter video for you like to watch. So the next section that we're gonna focus in on is what I call like our brassicas. So these are our, our leafy greens. They're the ones related to the cabbage family. So the next couple of like slides are what we plant in the spring uh, from like the, the greens and the brassica family. So number one, uh, broccoli. So again, same thing from now until March 15th, you can get broccoli into the ground. But the thing that you wanna make sure that you do with the broccoli is that you wanna make sure you start with a transplant. So most of the, the, the leafy greens that we're gonna talk about uh, from the brassicas or the cabbage family, we encourage you to start with a transplant versus seeds, except for some specialty ones that I'm gonna highlight a little bit later on in this, like this talk or this conversation, all right? All right, and then uh, we just added to like the to the chat box the link to the do it yourself toolkit, so you can be able like to go there right now and just save it as a bookmark for you guys to view. So again, transplants. That's where you want to get started with your brassicas. And again, everything that you're gonna realize there are 120 varieties of more of what you can plant, different styles, different things. What we tend to do is a variety called Green Magic. And that's just because it's more heat tolerant for us here in Southwest Georgia. Um, a lot of our transplants, you can get them from your, your big box stores. You can get them from everywhere here locally from Bennett's to Mark's to Lawn and Barbara um, as well. So just again, we just offer, we encourage people to go with the Green Magic. It's more heat tolerant. And then also the Green Magic itself, it can produce like a cryo within like 45 to 60 days. So if you're a planet like now, kind of going into the first of May, you have like a decent sized crown that you may like to harvest and, and eat off of and just feel comfortable um, enjoying um, some broccoli. So again, start with transplants. Broccoli, you want to do in the square foot gardening uh, method, you want to do one plant per square. So if you had like a, a garden box that was four feet by four feet, you can fit in like 16 squares per. Um, that's how it tends to work. And again, this is how the broccoli packs are sold. They tend to be more in the six pack variety whenever you go to the box stores to pick some up. Now this is, this is key. So all, all of our brassicas that we plant for the spring, in addition to the compost that we just put into the garden space, we make sure that we add compost directly into the hole where we put like the transplant in. And so for like the compost, you can get like the mushroom compost or cow compost that are already in bags. Just put like a scoop of it directly into the hole as you're putting the transplant in. Um, and this goes for all of the brassicas that we're growing for the spring. We do this with all of them. 
because they're all heavy feeders. And this is a good way of putting a slow releasing fertilizer um, into the hole for them to feed off of, especially as they're reintroducing themselves and reestablishing their roots in the growing space. So you kind of want to make sure you do that. And then the other thing that you want to make sure you do for all your transplants is take the time to break up the root ball that kind of formulated at the bottom of the tray. And literally what that is, is when you pull the plant up out of the tray, that tells you see the roots kind of wrapped around the base of it. You literally want to pinch those apart, break those up before you put them into the ground because you want to train the roots to grow downward um, into the soil versus having the roots keep continue that, that pattern of like a circle into the hole. So you want to break them up so the roots are trained to go downward directly into the soil. And these are just your basic stages of growing broccoli. And I, and I always like to show the stages because we oftentimes get asked, when is it time to harvest your broccoli? All right. And so I always tell people, once that crown really gets to be a decent size, you might want to start to harvest it because if it starts to split, that could be a sign that it's um, going to seed. Um, and then once it goes to seed, it's basically like a, you've created like a pollinator garden. Um, unless you let it dry off and you want to use the seed for seed planting, but you want to get it when the crown is like the size of a tennis ball or the size of a grapefruit, um, go right ahead and harvest that broccoli for your garden space. How to harvest it, you can take like a knife and just cut it, cut it at the shoot. A lot of times we work with kids, we use um, pruners just to cut the base of it on the garden spot. And then you can also let your garden, um, your broccoli stay in the garden. Um, because you start to get little bro um, broccolets, like florets that start to shoot off to the side, where you kind of get some additional cuttings off of the broccoli plant. So we'll do the main crown, let it let it stay in the ground for you know a couple weeks or so, harvest a couple like florets and things off of it. Um, and again, broccoli is one of those um, crops we love growing in the school gardens. Um, the kids love to eat it. You can eat it raw. You can eat it cooked. So it has like a lot of versatility as a as a community garden a school garden um, crop. So in a container, it's gonna really be just one broccoli plant uh, per container. So for broccoli, we kind of encourage you to do um, a minimum of a container, so um, three gallon, a three gallon container. But of course, you know us, you can use a five gallon bucket and still be fine. But if you are gonna do broccoli, um, your collars, your other brassicas and containers, we actually recommend that you do like a mixture of like a, a three to one of compost and potty mix, just kind of mixed in together. <clears throat> so it's like a little bit, you know, three, I would say two to one. So a little bit of the potty mix and a little bit of the compost mixed into your container. And that just literally has to do with like water retention, fertilizing, and that sort of game plan. And then, like I said, also, because these are heavy feeders, you're going to want to make sure if you are doing it in a container that you're fertilizing it once a month after you plant it. So, again, that garden on um, plant tone, sprinkle a little bit of that powder from the fertilizer around the base of the plant once a month until you, like, harvest it out. So you want to make sure that you get in that habit. Containers once a month, in ground every two weeks fertilizing the plant to make sure you're feeding it properly so it can grow up to its full potential. You have like a great harvest for the community. So now, greens. So the first slide is what we call um, Asian greens. So these are like your Chinese, um, your Asian greens are like quick growing, um, more for like sauteing type greens. A lot of these you can just do by seed. They grow extremely fast. So within about 40 days, um, you will have these ready, and uh, but they're related to your broccolis, your cabbage, and your collards, and so forth. Um, so I always include them in that mix, but we actually grow these a lot more for our salad mixes. So they really kind of tie into, they definitely tie into our lettuce, but you grow them the same way that you do your brassicas, which is your broccoli, your cabbage, and so forth. Other green, these are the ones you guys are more familiar with, which is like our kale, our mustards, a collards, things like that. I'm just gonna kind of recap how we grow these in our garden spaces and things like that as well. So I'll get to that as well, Brent, and type of compost that we use. So same time of year, we're planting collards and things now from the middle 
uh, February, going into like the first of March, but you want to start with transplants. And you want to do that because the heat will kick in and you definitely want to make sure your plants are ready to be harvested by the first of May, middle of May, because we all know that once it starts to get hot, the bug pressure increases, which means that you will have to have, the, you will have to use uh, like some sort of like pest control mechanism off of controlling your plants, but we want to try to get you to grow things naturally and, I mean, and as chemical free as possible um, for your backyard gardeners and your community gardeners. So the space and everything is similar to what we do for the broccoli. So again, you wanna make sure that they are spaced out, you know, 12 inches apart if they're in the rows and the raised garden boxes using square foot gardening. You're gonna do one plant per square. And if you're doing like the containers, again, one plant per square, you wanna make sure that they are at least in a three gallon container for you like to utilize uh, for growing um, into the garden space. So I'm gonna pause here because one thing that we have to that we have been teaching people about um, collards, um, mustard greens, and kale is that for some reason people don't know that you can crimp the leaves when it comes time for harvest. Because a lot of times in our community garden space, we notice that we're going to an area and people have literally pulled up the entire collard and kale plant and uh, mustard plant out the grain. And we want to show people that if you just crimp the leaves you kind of can keep picking and keep harvesting up until um, we've had some farmers that we work with have talked about that they planted collards in October and they were still harvesting the collards all the way through May just because they kept crimping the leaves and kept fertilizing the plant and it just kept growing and kept maturing. So we want to encourage people to follow the same pattern. So the only thing that we tell people is that you can crimp the leaves long as you leave in the center, which is what we call the heart of the greens. So again, this is a way for you to have a, a constant harvest in a small space by planting the collards and the kale into the garden space. So same thing with containers. Again, you just wanna just make sure if you do do the Asian greens from seeds, please water every day until they germinate um, with those seeds, the Asian greens. Again, four to six inches apart um, in the container into the bucket. So literally, if you're doing square foot gardening, you could do four of the aged green plants per square. And if you're doing the, the bigger ones, the kale, the, the collards, the broccoli and the mustard, one plant per 12 inch or one plant for five gallon bucket. <clears throat> and then also the emphasis too, with the buckets. Please make sure that you have made drainage holes into the bottom because you don't want your plants to sit um, in water um, in the roots and things like that, all right? And again, if you let your plants sit in too long, um, you haven't harvested yet, similar thing like I showed you with the broccoli, uh, Mother Nature will let you know when it's time for them to, for it's time for it to reproduce itself. And we call it bolting. And a lot of time that happens again First mid-May going into June, it gets extremely hot. It's, it's time to go to see um, the leaves that taste bitter, they're nastier tasting. So you don't you want to make sure that you harvest it before they start bolting. And then for those that are like seed savers and have grown heirloom varieties, you can let them grow out and dry out and then be able to harvest the seeds. We don't do a lot of that in our community gardening spaces just because of time and and, and us trying to feed the community immediately. But if you're a backyard grower, you could probably definitely look into how to do some seed saving uh, with, with some of the plants that you're growing in your garden space. So I'm just gonna like get ready to close out this section. So our main predator that we deal with with our brassicas, our broccoli, our cabbage, uh, my collards, our kale, is what we call like the, the, cabbage, the cabbage looper. So it's like, a, if you look at the underleaf, of your plants, you might see like a small green um, worm or better yet, you might be walking through your garden and see like a, a, a nice white butterfly. The kids like to say, oh, look at that pretty butterfly. That's not a pretty butterfly, that's a moth. And that moth basically indicates that it is eating up your plants. You will start to see holes. Um, you'll start to see their droppings and things like that. So just something to be mindful of. And so, what we recommend that people do, either you can remove the caterpillar um, by hand or its eggs, or you can use a product that's called like Dipel, which has, um, di uh, which has a product, we call it BT, which is a biological solution that you can spray on the leaves of your plants. Um, it won't harm you 
um, is basically you can use it the same day of harvesting, but it's just a way to control the, uh, the cabbage worm or some people have actually purchased what are called tripagama wasps that are natural predators for those that benefit us and as a natural alternative way to control the cabbage looper. And, and most of these products um, you can find at, again, um, at Bennett's, Mark's, at the box stores, there for you to pick up, or you can go online and order them directly from like Amazon and some other like locations to have them shipped directly to your home. All right, any questions on the brassicas? All right, look like we were pretty good. So next we're gonna talk about like lettuce. Um, so with the lettuce, this is gonna be really like just real simple. Again, there are hundreds of varieties of lettuce that you can do. Um, we tend to focus in on like four main types. We're gonna do a butterhead, a romaine, a type of like loose leaf and like some sort of like red, red lettuce as we're doing like our own basic sort of salad mix. So again, with the spacing, the space of the plants are, are very similar. Um, only thing that's different is romaine. We tend to do the romaine just two per square, square foot gardening because they tend to get a tad bit bigger. But the, the butterhead, the loose leaf varieties, we do like four plants um, per square because we're harvesting the leaves and kind of cutting them out, cutting them and let them come again type varieties. Um, again, there's so much that you could possibly do. Um, normally, if you're doing them in rows, you want to have like your, your lettuce plants spaced out about six to eight inches apart. If you're doing them in rows, we mainly do a lot of our lettuce per se at our community garden spots, really in our raised garden boxes, or we do them in our five gallon buckets. I um, mean, that's just because again, lettuce is one of those crops that we are, that we're harvesting, we're coming again, it's just a lot easier for us to use. And we mainly use the field for more of like our big heavy feeders um, and things like that. And the blessing of lettuce, um, it's a light feeder. So it really works out well, like in a crop rotation to kind of follow like a heavy feeder with like lettuce as something to put into your crop rotation. When it's time to plant um, lettuce during this time of year, we do a lot of it by transplants. Um, again, we have like a short window before it gets hot. Um, and if it gets too hot too quickly, the lettuce itself will start to bolt, similar to like the brassicas. So a lot of our lettuce plants, we begin those from transplants. Um, and, and before we get them to the ground versus doing it from seeds. We do a lot of our seed lettuce planting um, in the fall. Same thing, you wanna make sure you break up the root ball as you're planting it, but then also as you put it to the ground, you wanna make sure that you've added some compost, again, just a slow release of fertilizer into the hole where you're planting your lettuce plants. So there are different techniques when it comes to lettuce. Like I said earlier, a lot of times you can actually go to the store and you buy what are called like salad mixes, which is a lot of different varieties of lettuce is already there. Um, you can sprinkle those out because a lot of time with the salad mixes, they are designed for them to be harvested in about 25 to 30 days. But also remember, anything that you plant by seed, you have to water it every day until you see it germinate. Uh, it, I keep emphasizing that because a lot of times we, we found with our school gardens that we'll plant something by seed uh, on Thursday and and nothing ever happens in that garden spot because we didn't follow the rule of having water on the plant every day until it germinates. All right. And then the other thing that we do as far as our lettuce is just like we talked about before, square foot gardening, even block spacing in a small area. You can get a lot growing lettuce wise. It's organized. It's easy uh, for you to maintain in your space with weed control and things like that. All right, and this again, just talking about the different varieties that we focus in on when we're doing like our garden spaces and when we're growing things out. So this is just what we, what we emphasize doing. And then when it's time to harvest, basically like two sort of techniques, both of them are very simple. So either we go out there with like a pair of scissors, put like the, the lettuce in our hand, we do like the salad mix kind of right above an inch or two above the soil line um, because most time they'll reproduce. And then like in the case of our romaine um, and some of our butterheads, we'll just crimp the leaves, the outer leaves of the plant, um, pinching it near like the, the heart um, and do that for like the stem just when the time like the harvest. And again, the lettuce that we plant now, uh, if everything goes according to plan and mother nature doesn't shoot us with a bunch of 90 degree days, we actually can begin starting harvesting lettuce about the middle of April going into May. And again, like I said, if it gets too hot, 
your lettuce starts to boat. You want to definitely harvest it before then because what happens, the lettuce gets bitter. It's not sweet tasting. Uh, but again, if you do let it boat, you might have some flowers that could be attractive for some of our pollinators and you can let them sit on there and dry out. So if you want to kind of do your own harvesting of your own um, lettuce seed for your backyard gardening and sharing it for like sweet, um, for like seed swaps and things like that. Same thing with a container. And the thing about lettuce, you don't necessarily need like a deep container. You just need something again that's roughly about eight inches deep. Um, it could be on your windowsill, outside, buckets, whatever. Just make sure again, it has drainage holes on it. And if you are again planting seeds that you have a method for watering your lettuce plant every day until like the seed germinates. So again, following like the same tradition is um, spinach. But the interesting thing about spinach is that it's not related to lettuce. It's more related to like your, your beets and your Swiss chard family. And again, what I like about spinach, it's a fasting grower. Um, you can do it, you can do it the same way we did lettuce. You can do it broadcast wise, or you can do it individual sort of block planting. And again, it's a quick window, length of time from harvesting. And then in some instances, some varieties of spinach we use, we use a variety called Sun Angel. It's like a cut and come again. We can get again about two or three cuttings off of that one plant of lettuce that lies us through that particular growing season. So again, basic in lifespan of like a, let, a lifespan of spinach, seedlings, harvest, then again, just paying attention to when it boats out. And a lot of times you kind of can tell when it's getting to that point of boating because the leaves themselves start to change shape a little bit. Um, and so you just want to just be mindful of harvesting it before it starts to boat. So again, just some basic ideas for planting. We're in the right time frame, square foot gardening, nine plants per square. If you're doing them in rows, four inches apart. And if you do have more um, seeds in that area, you might have to thin them out um, based upon how you sowed them in general and things like that. And again, if you wanna have a, a consistent fresh harvest, you wanna do lettuce similar to the same way we talked about turnips and maybe even the same way you can do lettuce. You wanna do session planting. So every couple of weeks, you might just want to do like another little plot of like spinach to kind of make sure you keep it going and growing throughout the spring um, growing season. Same thing with containers. We talked about this before, a mixture of like potting soil and compost mixed in together. And again, spinach, you don't have to plant it extremely deep. You only talk about a half inch deep, four inches apart, and you can have a, a, a bountiful harvest. Now, it is something as well. If you're into doing sprouts and other things, you can do that. But like I said before, if you're looking at this, some good tender baby leaves of spinach, it's ready in about 30 days. You want some bigger leaves, you can wait another 30, 40, 60 leaves. And again, like I said before, spinach will regrow. It's a cut and come again type crop. Long as you kind of leave about like an inch above like the soil line for it to kind of keep reproducing itself and things like that. So carrots, this is a, a fan favorite, but there's a lot of work in order to grow carrots. So one of the things that we encourage people to do kind of similar how we do potatoes is prepare your garden space ahead of time before you plant your carrots. So that might mean you digging up the ground with like a time fork, a spade fork, really loosen it up, breaking it up, because what you want to do, you want to remove any obstacles that could be in the way of your carrot growing because carrot is a root crop. It's going downward. And if that happens to be like a, a, a little rock or a pebble or a brick in the way, that's going to cause your carrot to maybe split or maybe just stop growing in general. So you want to make sure you take the time to prepare the space that you're growing carrots in way before you begin planting them. So again, this is just some basic steps. So when it comes to us doing carrots in rows, we like to make like a furrow that's about, again, six, we do put them on the double rows when we're doing them in ground. Um, the rows are spaced six inches apart, like a drip tape running down the center of the bed. And then it also, carrots, real simple, kids love it. We get them, I call it, um, I always tell the kids when it's time to plant carrots, it's time for us to put some sprinkles on it. So they just sprinkle the seeds in between um, the rows that we created. And the thing about carrots, you don't have to cover them up heavy. It's just a light dusting on the top of the seed that works for us. And the thing that we also use too, um, we like to use what's called pelletized carrots. 
So these are carrot seeds that have like a little clay shell around them that makes it easier for us to hold and to do stuff with. And so, like I said, I'm gonna be doing some videos um, crop related of how we do these and I would demonstrate and showcase, you know, these, these pelletized carrots that we like to use. Again, two to three inches of spacing. So carrot is definitely one of those crops that you will have to thin out. And so a lot of times what we tell people to do is just do um, a little bit at a time, like a couple feet at a time, because a thinning of carrots can be, can be very um, um, taxing or, or tedious, as like the kids like to say. So you want to make sure that you have like the spacing, the space them out um, every two to three inches and, and thin them out again every two to three inches um, in the carrot space. So again, when it's time to harvest, I always tell people you could kind of gently um, scrape around the base of the, the, the carrot plant. If it's roughly about the size of a quarter or bigger, then you know it's, it's probably ready to be pulled out the soil. Um, if you need to loosen up, you could always use like a digging fork, but I've kind of found that if you've done the prep work, added the compost into the garden space before you planted the carrots, that it, it really easily breaks, like pulls up freely uh, from like the garden space. So same thing with containers. The main thing that you want to pay attention to with the carrots in a container is that you want to um, make sure that the, the container itself is deep enough uh, for the carrots to grow. So what I oftentimes I tell people is think in terms like a five gallon bucket of work, um, but if you can find like a 15 gallon or a 25 gallon, like um, again, um, wine barrel, those work extremely well for like growing your carrots and stuff in. And normally when we're doing carrots, if the conditions are right and you're doing it by seed and you're watering, again, about seven to 14 days, uh, maybe sooner, the carrots should be like germinating. Now, the only thing difference is that when we use our pelletized carrots, um, it takes a little bit longer for the germination to happen because that clay has a dissolve um, in order for like the carrot itself to take root. But if you are watering seven days pretty regularly, you should start to see it sprout up. And again, remember, Carrots are a seed that you don't have to plant extremely deep. Um, you're just basically planting it and just dusting over the seed when it's there. So now we're just gonna head on kind of stay in this root family mode, uh, beets. So again, another thing that's really easy to grow and you wanna make sure that they are like spaced out, again, about two inches or so apart. Um, a lot of times when we do it, I'm sorry, back to carrots. If you are doing square foot gardening, um, you're roughly going to do about 16 carrot plants in a one foot by one foot space. So 16 carrot plant plants fit in a one foot by one foot space. And if you are doing the raised beds, you want to make sure that your, your raised garden boxes are a minimum of 10 inches um, deep for your carrot roots to establish. Uh, most of ours, we do our 16 just to give us a little bit more space for what we're doing. All right. So again, but the care with the brought with the beets back to the beets. Again, you want to just space them out, um, keep the water germinate until like they um, water until they germinate. Uh, beets are one of those things that we do sow as a seed directly into the ground. Now we do have some people that have done them as transplants, uh, but we again sow these directly into the ground. If we have to thin them out, we just pay attention to it and stuff like that. But the beets are also one of those plants that we do in the session planting. So every two or three weeks, we do another planting of them. Um, and then with the being the springtime, we only really do like two or three session plantings because again, once it starts to get hot, you wanna have a, a higher like bug pressure. And again, we want you to go things natural and um, chemical free as possible. So this is like a, a technique that we do with kids where we make what's called like a, what we make a, what we call like a beet seed tape. Where we literally take um, like some toilet paper um, and a little bit of Elmer's glue, put the seeds of the beets spread out four inches apart for the kids to be able to do. It's a really good like exercise or so, like a link to it to really get the children involved like in, in growing beets and things like that. So create like a bead seat tape is like an easier um, way for like your spacing to be on point. You also can do the same thing with carrots. So again, just look out for like the video that I create for you to see some more hands on um, demonstration on exactly what it is that I'm doing. Same thing with containers. Again, into the pot, you know, six, four to six inches apart in spacing. We do a square foot gardening. Normally with beets, we say you could do um, about four beet plants per square. Um, Tens of work, or you might even maybe do nine of them based upon how you want to go. And then also with beets, you can also eat the leaves. 
So a lot of people mix in like the beet leaves with their salad mixes and things like that as well. Radishes. Radishes is like the, <laughs> is, the is the quickest um, plant that I think you could grow. Cause like literally in like less than four weeks, you could be eating fresh radishes out of your garden space. So this is definitely something that we encourage people to do more session planting of. And then the thing about radishes too, you can grow a lot of them in a small space. So you don't need like a huge garden area unless you're just a fanatic of radishes. Radishes is definitely one of those crops that we put in a grow exclusively in a container or a small corner of your raised bed. We rarely do radishes like in a huge in-ground garden plot because um, until we find somebody that's like a, a ultimate fan of radishes, but we love the, the different colors and the quick, um, the quick germination and the quick growing habit of radishes because it's one of those crops for a beginning grower, for a school garden that in, a, in 30 days, the kids are already harvesting something um, that they can consume or put into like a, a salad mix so they can say they take ownership of it. And then the other thing with radishes, they come in so many unique colors and, and sizes that it gets to give kids like so much variety. So again, the same sort of thing. Um, radishes are very similar in like how we do turnips, how we do um, carrots that you're gonna to have to thin them out, but rather than trying to pull the plant all the way out themselves, we just kind of encourage you to just pinch um, right at the root line and just leave one of them standing. Then eventually they will all grow out uh, for like your growing habits, for like your radishes. So, and again, this is just something that we wanna make sure that you know about session planting. So every two weeks, go ahead and sow a couple more radishes so you can have like the fresh salad and things like that. Daikon radishes has been like a new favorite that a lot of people have been using um, in the community gardens, um, like specialty gardens and on and so forth. So again, same sort of, but the spacing is a little bit different than your other normal um, radishes that you do. Um, so normally they're six inches apart and they are roughly about um, four per square. Same sort of technique, just another reminder about how to do radishes and containers. So with the with the radishes, with the with the beets, uh, with your turnips, uh, the main pest that we deal with is our uh, flea beetles. Uh, so they're just like a smaller little bug. They tend to again attack like your brassica family. You might even see it in your your eggplants and all and so forth. But we'll come back to that when we talk about our our summer garden. And so just being on the lookout for them and how to identify them in your garden space. Cause that's your main like target area. And the main way that we kind of deal with them um, is like really like two folds. So like the, well, three folds. So number one, um, we, we, if, it's, if we know that the, the pressure is about to increase, we'll just put like a floating um, row cover or a type of sheet over the plant. Cause a lot of times the flea beetles, they, they come and attack even the time and at night, just to kind of keep the plants like covered and growing. Um, the second thing that we do is like we plant what we call uh, like trap crops. I know I talked a minute a minute ago about radishes and us being able to eat them, but you don't necessarily eat the radish leaves per se. You eat more of the radish roots. And so we'll plant some more like radishes near area to attract the flea beetles away from the collars, the kale, the turnip as like a trap crop. Or then also what we do is like sprinkle um, some diatomaceous earth um, on the leaves of the different plants so around like the base of the plants. And diatomaceous earth is getting a biological solution. And basically what it is, it's, um, it's like small, like, like, like fragments of like, um, like sand. And, but as a soft shell animal, like the flea beetle crawls across it, um, it, it tends to, it cuts them up. So it discourages them from going any further because now they have cuts and bruises on their body. So they're no longer go in that direction. So that's just a, a way to deal with flea beetles in your, your radish plot, your turnip plot, as well as in your, your brassica plot. So the last couple of things we're gonna just talk about are just some basic herbs. So right now, we really start growing herbs in our garden spaces. I'm really kicking up, of course, for the summer months, but the main herbs that we grow are number one, cilantro. So we introduce and encourage people now to do cilantro again from transplants. Um, you can do one cilantro plant per square foot. You can do uh, 12 feet apart, like in a row. You can sow them by seed. But again, if you do anything by seed, make sure you keep it watered every day until it germinates. And what we like about the cilantro plant is that as long as you keep it growing, uh, it, it's going to be there. But if it does bolt, 
you can actually let it bolt because then you can start to use it as a, as a coleander, as another ingredient in dishes um, and things like that. And so it's one of those things where cilantro, in some instances, we mix cilantro in a lot of our pollinator gardens um, because we know it's going to bolt. Uh, we know it's going to produce a flower. We know we can harvest those. And then it actually reseeds itself. So if those the environment is, co is correct, this plant will kind of will keep growing in the same garden space like year after year after year. So we tend to make this part of our pollinator garden. And then even when we do our herb gardens, we look at our herb gardens being more permanent in structure versus some that are just annual that you kind of keep having to redo every year. So we try to find locations at our community spots, school gardens um, that are more permanent for like establishing herb gardens for the traits like the cilantro offers because they will receive themselves what they see. And again, we're not fertilizing them. Mother nature is taking care of them. And a lot of times too, um, it really helps with, um, again, uh, pollination, things like that. So other plant that we do a lot during our, our spring garden is that we introduce dill into the garden space. Um, same sort of spacing, 12 inches apart um, in a square foot garden space, one plant um, per, same thing like in the rows, um, 12 inches apart like in a direct row, let it grow out. Again, just paying attention. We tend to do a lot of these by transplants, but if you are worried to do it by seed, you know the rule, make sure you water until it germinates, all right? So same thing with dill. Same thing in a container, one plant per. It does have like an extremely long like tap root. So it's very similar to like carrots that you want to make sure that it's in a container that's at least a minimum of about eight to 10 inches deep. And when you're doing it, um, and so again, you're just clipping and harvesting it, but you want to make sure that the dill plant, same with the um, um, cilantro, is exposed six to eight hours of direct sunlight. All right, so this last little piece is again, if you have any questions, that'd be great. So just something for you to start to think about because um, we gave you a lot of things that you can grow. You know you know your condition and stuff better than anybody else. So you just have to kind of make the choice. Are you growing on farm rows, in containers, or raised garden beds? But all three will really work for your spring garden. So everything that I just talked about, we have grown them uh, at Flint River Fresh, again, at our community garden sites, at our school gardens, even at our demonstration sites. So everything that we just talked about today, we have literally grown it and harvested and provided it for the community. So this just, again, some of the benefits of growing things in a row. Um, you don't have to worry about carpentry skills. You can basically just have like a tiller, break the ground up, pay attention to the amendments. And in some ways, a native soil actually is a better water retainer um, for you and a nutrients retainer than the raised beds or the container bucket. And so then again, easier irrigation system, as I talked about, if you know you're gonna be gone for a while, it's a lot easier for you to set up some sort of watering system that can be automatic, easy for you to do. Raised beds, we prefer them as well. A lot of our school gardens, mainly because they are um, easy to manage, less soil compaction because you're not walking in and out the rows. You're basically walking around a perimeter of the garden boxes, uh, but also it gives you like a longer growing season because the raised boxes, um, the soil warms up faster than the in-ground garden plot. Um, number one reason, less weed maintenance, easy for you to maintain, and also because you also can, you also the one creating the soil environment, you can create the correct growing spaces uh, for the garden. And then also it's a benefit for those with like disabilities that can't bend over as low, things like that. You have these elevated garden boxes for you like to grow in. So again, just want to make sure if you are doing these raised boxes, even as we talked about before, always have a readily add about two inches of compost every growing season. And then somebody asked in the chat, what type of compost and things like that that we use. So you could actually just go to like the box store, pick up like some black cow, some mushroom compost, utilize that in the garden space. We're here locally. We've been able to utilize um, gin trash from some of these big um, gin uh, farmers. Uh, we've been able to utilize, of course, like cow manure, mushroom compost. We've also been able to use like um, horse manure from farmers that have been composted and sat down the heat has changed as well as um, um, compost from chicken houses. So we at Flint River Fresh 
especially in our big demonstration sites, we try to utilize, try to reuse a lot of our uh, extra, um, I guess you say extra waste in our community. And then also, if you are a backyard gardener, you might be able to do like your own home-based composting where you make, you have your own composting system at home with food scraps that have been broken down or you rather take all your leaves up from the fall, put them into your garden space, shred them up with the mower, mix that stuff in. Um, you just wanna make sure we kind of encourage on our conservation side to really encourage people doing more composting in their gardening as a way to protect the earth. We, we're sending less uh, food or less waste to our big landfills, um, especially the things that we can reuse um, in our environment, like to grow food and things like that. So same thing with container gardenings. Only thing about those is you have to pay attention again, like I said, about the carrots, making sure you know like the root um, structure of what you're growing. Some plants, you only can do one plant per container. So just understanding how much you can do and what um, and things like that. And then of course we have some more workshops coming up. So uh, March the 18th, I'll be doing another like food gardening on uh, one-on-one -on -one basics for you being able to join us on um, the end of March, March 25th. I do a similar workshop like this, where I literally go through what we're planting in our summer garden, how we're planting them, how we're taking care of them, uh, what I recommend for fertilizing them, also what I recommend for basic pest control. And then at the beginning of April, I'm gonna do a, a workshop that's all about pest control. So I'm literally gonna go through the pests that we see in gardens in the spring and summertime and how we handle them, what, um, what we do biological, what we do, what I call using um, our hands. And if you had to go to the stream, what are like some proven um, chemical solutions and things like that that you can use uh, for that. So if you wanna follow us again in the chat box, this video will be uploaded to our uh, website, flintriverfresh.org, floor slash DIY hyphen toolkit. Um, and then you can also follow us on these different social media pages. And so this is our basic sort of contact information. Um, so again, you can reach out to us in the office or you can email us, follow us up on, online through the website. And I'm gonna just check the chat box one more time to see if there are any other questions um, and things like that, that you can. And, um, and so, and then also we, we do have like a link that we're creating like a full YouTube channel where all these videos will be like back to back for you guys to be able like to, to read, like to click on a link and be able to scroll through all of them in an organized manner on YouTube for you to view. And so